Oh, uh, hi, this is Mike. I'm ready to start recording. All right. All right. That's why I don't know if it bothers or if you even notice it, but the noise sometimes going past here just drives me crazy. Uh, makes it hard to focus. It's, you know, by, by my normal schedule, I mean, it's the middle of the night for me now anyhow, you know, at the ungodly hour of 9 a.m. So uh, I tend to be a night owl, so I don't know, maybe that's it. But no, even in my afternoon classes, the, the noise, just folks walking around the hall really is distracting for me. So we'll try closing the door. Um, let me sketch out the rest of the semester. Uh, uh, in a big sense, the rest of the semester is relating to uh, your project. So anything I can do to help you or support you get your project done. I will probably ask periodically how your project is going, see if there's any questions. Sometimes questions people have are good for everyone to hear. And other times they require more of uh, individual attention. So let me be the judge of that. So I, I will probably ask oftentimes uh, if you have questions about your project. And in fact, today we're going to spend a few minutes before we get into the, the material proper just chatting about the project. Um, CSS layout is a big thing for the rest of the semester. We want to make sure that we get our layouts down and try a variety of things would be my suggestion. Um, we can't possibly cover everything that you could run into with CSS layouts. As I, I told someone, I forget who, I think via email, that you know CSS layouts in a way is like, uh, is like the game of chess, whereas really there's a few simple rules of selectors and things like that, but yet the combinations of how you put all those things together is, is endless. So we can't cover every case of CSS, but we've talked about some of the tools that we have at our disposal. We've talked about uh, absolute positioning. We've talked about relative positioning. We've talked about just the general flow. And then lastly, we've talked about um, floating the elements. And those can be all mixed and matched, all right, uh, to, to give a lot of flexibility in terms of how your page is laid out. So. Um, Every example that we go over from here on in will also be a CSS layout example because we'll not just talk about uh, the new topics that we're talking about, uh, but we'll talk about um, CSS layout. Our main topics for uh, the rest of the term are tables, which we should talk about, should at least start talking about today, um, forms, and JavaScript. Um, forms in JavaScript are just sort of an introduction to, to those technologies. And when we get to that point, we'll, we'll explain why. JavaScript, I mean, you could have a whole course in itself on JavaScript. Um, and, and the amount of time that we devote to it is really going to be enough to show you the capabilities of it and sort of give you the general idea. And, you know, then, then you, know, you can go and, and learn more stuff uh, about it. Forms, we can talk about setting up the forms in HTML. However, we don't cover server-side scripting in this class, so we're, we're not going to be able to really do a lot with the form data once it's been submitted. Um, ah, we will also talk about mobile development, mobile web development. Uh, in other words, we've sort of alluded to that, and we, we've sort of talked and touched on that topic throughout the term. We'll spend a little bit more time talking about mobile development um, um, throughout the term. So that's about it. One last thing before we get into um, a, a brief discussion of the project is I have some um, material, some brochures from career services. All right. I would strongly urge any of you that are interested to, to get the material and look at it and talk to those folks. Um, about it. And, you know, if you're uh, in, in my online class, feel free to email me and, and I can put you in touch with the right person. Um, 
And uh, again, um, but I have some handouts for the people that are actually here. If, if you're not here in class today, but you are on, comp on campus, feel free to, to, to hunt me down and, and I can give you one of these handouts. Or again, just email me and, and I can do it. It's really important uh, for people that, 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 that want to pursue this as a career. The hardest part is getting a break and, and getting into it uh, to begin with. And I would suspect that's probably the, the, the truth uh, in a, a lot of uh, job areas. But I think it's especially true in technology. Um, you'll hear, for example, you know, all the forecasts for, for job growth in technology still are very good. You know, one of the fastest growing fields, just saw a couple articles, um, it was a Money Magazine posted uh, uh, software development is, is one of the top fields to get into. Um, yet, the tough part is breaking into the field, you know, and getting that first job because oftentimes, of course, they want folks with experience and they want people that, that are proven to be able to do the stuff that they want them to do. And then that's the, the age old dilemma how do you get the experience if, if everyone's looking for experience? One of the ways to answer that question is via internships. With internships, um, there's a certain expectation of the employer that's a little different than just for an ordinary job. They know that they're getting a student, all right, and therefore they don't quite have the same expectations uh, for you. Um, it's a good chance uh, to, to, to learn and to apply what you've learned in a realistic situation. You know, I, I may try my best to make the assignments realistic, but my assignments are just that, are, are assignments. They're not real world situations. And, and, you know, you really get that uh, when you go and work somewhere, even on an internship. Just to see how the pieces of things fit together in an organization, uh, an internship is valuable. So there's all sorts of benefits to it. So if anyone is all interested, make sure you see me after class and I can give you a brochure. Or we can talk about it. Uh, anyone wanting more information can email me. All right. On to the project discussion. What I like to do first is, is just briefly run through the main sections of your project design, which is due sometime soon. Next week, I think. Is that correct? 7th, I think, of November. Is that right? Yeah, 7th of November. 7th of November, so is that next week? No. The week after. All right. All right. Cool. Well, good. Uh, that way I'm not giving you advice today that, and it's due on Wednesday and you have no chance to implement it. So it's good. It's a little bit of a head. All right. Um, what is due on the 7th is your design. And again, one of the things I try to stress in this class and all my classes is that very rarely are great things done by folks that are just flying by the seat of their pants, by people that are just winging it. Typically, um, good design happens when, uh, or, or good results happen when people make a deliberate effort to figure out what they need to do before doing it and then going and doing it. All right, so really any task of any size whatsoever, I think, requires some sort of planning in order to be most effective. And so what we're doing in this assignment is we're coming up, before we code it, we're coming up with a design document. Why are we coming up with a design, why do you come up with a design document, you know, uh, in the real world? You do it for a couple reasons. First of all, you may not be the only person working on this project, all right? And if you're working as part of a team, you need to share the ideas and make sure everyone on the team is on the same page. All right. So therefore, uh, a design document is very effective in communicating that. Um, oh, a uh, former boss of mine had a great quote. Let me see if I can remember it. Something like, the world's best memory still isn't good as faded ink or something like that. In other words, you may think, if you have a discussion with someone, you may think, oh, I'll remember that. All right. You know what? You might not. All right. It's best to document stuff. It's best to put things down. That way, everyone can look at it. Everyone can agree upon it. Everyone can see, um, you know, uh, where where the project stands. So, 
in terms of sharing with the other teammates that are going to be working on it, it's important to document your design. Second reason is to share it with the customer. Now when I talk about customer, often web projects are done by outside firms. You know, a company may not want to go and hire a full-time web developer. So they'll contract out with a, a development firm to come in and develop the website for, for them. So, and I worked in that mode for, uh, for a number of years where I worked for a firm and, and we went in and we did websites for uh, organizations that uh, told us what they needed and, and we went and built them. So a lot of times I'll talk about the customer, but even if you're part of the same organization, you can still consider the folks that you're developing um, your website for as sort of an internal customer. All right? They're the people who you're trying to satisfy their goals and needs and so on. So in terms of sharing what you have with your customer, a design document is, is valuable as well. All right. Again, it's about getting them on the same page, making sure it's documented, putting something out there tangible that people can look at and comment upon. Um, one analogy I give all the time is, if you asked me to what my perfect house would look like, I don't think I could tell you. Right? But if you showed me two or three houses and asked me, what do you like about this? What do you like about that? You might be able to piece together you know, a good design for a house, you know, should I win the lottery and I can build any house I want. All right? So the idea is, is that when people talk in vague terms, um, they don't necessarily understand what they're getting into. When people can actually see it set down on paper, they get a much clearer vision of what's going to be built. And that's another reason that you build a design document. All right. On to the project. Your design document will really consist of five sections. The first four of which are simply can be done in a Word document or, you know, other, other standard text documents. And the first section is your strategy section. And I'm not going to go over these in great detail because we have talked about them already. But I do want to uh, reiterate a couple key points on each of them. The strategy section is where you really define goals. And you define goals for both the organization making the site and for the people that are going to be viewing the site, the users. The users, remember, are not one group of people that are all identical. You have various kinds of users that are going to be visiting your site. It would be great if we could make a website for each individual that could be visiting our site, but we can't. But we can do better than saying, well, the user, and speak about them as though there are, there's just one group of people that's accessing the site. We can come up with different groups, different target audiences for our site. And in our example, those are called personas. So come up with three personas uh, about that and come up with goals for both the users and the organization that's creating the site. It's important when you define the goals, again, to make these goals specific to the content of your site as opposed to just general good web development principle goals. In other words, don't define as one of your goals. Your goal is to develop a site that's user friendly and has good navigation. Of course you're doing that, right? You wouldn't be taking this class and have a goal of being designed a site that has really bad navigation that's impossible to read and uh, impossible to navigate around. Of course you're not going to say that. So therefore you don't need to say that sort of thing. So what do you say? Things related to your particular um, project. For example, the law firm. Uh, I, I did give the option to any of you uh, wants to work on a site for the law firm that, that came in. A goal for them might be, for example, to demonstrate their competence in a particular area of law. All right? That doesn't have anything to do with web design. All right? um, that's something that is a goal of their content on that site. Whatever content they put on that site, they better have in mind that one of their goals is to 
uh, demonstrate that they're, their competency in a particular area. So again, the goal should be specific to your site and not just general web development goals. All right, like good navigation, attractive appearance, user friendly. I see those goals a lot. A lot of students put those in. And again, it's almost hard to mark them wrong because, you know, yeah, you do want to do that, but that's not specific to your site. So make sure your goals are defined specific to your site. In general, the more specific that you can be, the better off you're going to be throughout this process. The next section is the scope, which deals with specific requirements, or in other words, specific content that you're going to put on the site to satisfy those goals. So the requirements and the goals are very tightly linked. Again, these requirements should not be general web design principles. So again, don't say your site's going to be easy to navigate. Of course it's going to be easy to navigate. Um, instead, it will be the specific pieces of content that you're going to put on your site, put on your pages, that help you achieve the goal. Getting back to the law firm, if their goal is to demonstrate their competency in a particular kind of law, all right, that could be achieved several ways. One way is maybe to have a biography of each of the lawyers that discusses their schooling, uh, their achievements, um, maybe articles they've written in different publications, maybe speeches that they've given at conferences, and so on and so forth. All right. So that's a case of specific content that is meant to satisfy a goal. So in that case, the goal is to demonstrate their competence, the requirement would be a list of those things that you're going to put on the site that help achieve that goal, that help demonstrate the competence. Now, when, you're, when all is said and done, every goal that you define, you better have some requirements that match up to it. Right? If one of the goals of uh, the site is to um, Um, let's, let's think of something. Make sure that um, people understand all the ways that you can get in touch with us, for example. If you don't have anything on your site relating to that, well, then you failed, right? Because what you've defined as one of your top goals, you're not doing anything about. And that's not good. All right? So every goal should at least have one requirement that maps to it. Every requirement could map to multiple goals. There could be one thing that sort of covers a couple different, um, a couple different goals, and that's fine. But when you're done, every goal should have at least one requirement, and every requirement should correspond to a goal. Remember, we don't want to put extra stuff on our site. We don't want to put stuff on our site that really isn't essential, because if we do that, then um, we run the risk of distracting people from the stuff that's really important. All right? So don't think, well, what could it hurt to showcase my photography on this site? Well, if your site doesn't have anything to do with promoting yourself as a photographer, it could do a lot of damage, right? Because it could distract people from your goal and confuse them and so on and so forth. So that is the scope section. The next section is the structure section, where you decide how the material on your site is going to be organized. The scope section, you essentially have a list of everything that's going to be on your site. The structure section is where you say, hey, here's how I'm going to organize it. I'm going to put this stuff on this page. I'm going to put this stuff on this page. I'm going to have five pages underneath the home page, and so on and so forth. So it's where you, where you break down your content into specific pages and you uh, design um, sort of the structure of your site. Sort of, you know, draw a little chart um, of the site. That almost looks like a little organization chart. 
you know, maybe you have your home page and you have three options underneath that. And underneath each of these you have two. Or something like that. Third, or, or fourth rather, is a skeleton. Where the skeleton is where you draw these little wireframes that say, hey, in general, that's how my page is going to look. I'm going to have a banner, a navigation, and a content area. Now, you may only have one um, wireframe per your whole site. If all your pages have the same general layout, you really only need one. Or you might have a couple if there's a page that's sort of an oddball that, that sort of doesn't fit the mold of the other pages of the site. But you probably won't have a wireframe per page, a different wireframe per page. You know, So you might have one or maybe two, maybe even three. But if you're developing many more than three wireframes, you might not understand the concept of wireframes. And therefore, check with me. All right, because the idea uh, isn't to say specifically how a page is going to look, but just to describe sort of on a very high level what the main sections of your pages are going to look like, are going to be. Um, and again, for the most part, your pages are going to have sort of the same layout. Remember, that's a goal to make them look consistent. Lastly, we have the surface level. And the surface level is a prototype. What's a prototype? A prototype is sort of a working model of a few of your pages. I think I've asked for three for the design. And again, keep in mind that um, this is where you're going to actually start to bring your design to life and actually have maybe not 100% completed web pages, but you're going to have pages that are very close to how they're going to look when they're done. So the pages in the prototype don't have to be complete. You know, you might not have the right image for it yet, or you might not have done everything. Uh, you might not have written all the content, but you should have a pretty good idea of how it's going to look. So uh, Greek, text is fine. Greek text would be fine in a prototype. Um, developing a prototype is a balancing act, right? You want to make it look close to how it's going to finally look. But on the other hand, you don't necessarily need it to be perfect. In fact, if you make it perfect, you're probably spending too much time on it. All right? So you want sort of a midway ground. What if you spend hours just perfecting the prototype and your client or customer looks at it and says, oh, that's horrible. All right, I don't want it like that at all. All right, well, you'd have been better off maybe spending a little less time on it, making it a little less perfect, and then when they tell you, no, we don't like it at all, well, then you didn't waste a lot of time on it. And you can go in and you can make the revisions. All right? So, it, how do I want to say this? It requires a little bit of a thick skin in developing these prototypes, having been through this process many times. And I will even tell people that I'm developing websites for, look, I understand that you may hate the prototype that I developed. All right? And you may say, I don't like this about it, I don't like that about it. That's okay. You know, don't protect my feelings. Don't think that you're going to hurt my feelings by telling me this. The prototype is a way of tangibly showing what the website's going to look like. And if people criticize it and tell you they don't like it, indirectly they're telling you what they do want. All right? Again, it's the old People can't necessarily describe exactly what they want, but if you show them something, they can comment upon it and give you some feedback, and you can get an idea of, of, of ultimately what, what, what it is they want. So, yes? So it's okay if our prototype has maybe, you know, border, certain size, you know, colors, and then they come in and say, yeah, absolutely. Uh, remember, um, the, the question was is, is if you make your prototype look a certain way with a certain border or layout or whatever, and as you're, as you're 
finalizing the project, you decide it doesn't look good and change it, yeah, that's fine. Keep in mind, again, you know, in a real situation, you'd run it past the customer and have them look at it. But the whole idea of this is, is to create a design document is that the design document is a tool to help you get to where you want to be. All right. Um, as I stated, sort of my premise is that anything that you do um, that, that is a big effort, uh, any sort of larger project requires some sort of planning in advance. And your goal isn't to produce a great plan. Your goal is to produce a, a great website. So your plan is a means to get there. So if something changes, that's fine. All right. Um, not every website, you know, flows very smoothly from the first step to the second step to the third step. Oftentimes when you're working something, you may go back and revisit an earlier step of the plan to go back. And you may change things around. That's okay. It's a process designed to get you a good website in the end. And therefore, if things change from the way you've planned them, really on any of these levels, that's okay, as long as it's sort of consciously done. You know, you change the design because you look at it and say, you know, that doesn't work. Those borders are too wide. So I'll go and tweak it a little bit. It's absolutely part of the process. All right. I would suggest for building the prototype, you know, to first build your template for your wireframe and then make your clones of it. If you have one or two wireframes, build each of them and then, and then go and make the clones of it. And then, you know, have a go at it. Any questions about this process? Any questions about the design process? If you think about it, you're going from vague to specific. You're starting out identifying, gee, what is it we want to achieve? How are we going to achieve it? How are we going to organize it? How are we going to lay it out? And then finally, what is my page going to look like? So we're going from sort of very conceptual stuff to very concrete stuff. And we're making sure whatever we do, we're doing it deliberately and we're doing it as a matter of choice as opposed to... Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, just r a random act. All right, we're spending time to really think about this deliberately. Questions about this? Okay. Who has, who um, who wants to share their idea for their project? Okay, go ahead. What, what your project is about? Yeah. Okay. Direction. Okay. Okay. What was the last one? One of the things that I wanted to put on there is checklist. Okay. But I am worried about like getting a checklist to put on there. Okay. I'm not going to type all those words. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, the, uh, for the people that maybe didn't catch that uh, on the mic, um, it's a site about birding that would contain, you know, directions, uh, you know, hints about what you might see, and so on and so forth. I remember once I was out in, uh, what's that park that's just not too far from here? Sandy Ridge, yeah. Uh, and I was taking pictures, because I like to take pictures. And I must have ran into some birders, because they were telling me, you know, oh, can you hear such and such bird? And they made a call. And they said, that's different than such and such bird. And they made another call that sounded exactly like the first one. So I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I hear it now. Uh, and another time, someone was trying to point out a bird to me. And it's like, he was actually, he, I think he was actually getting angry with me. And it's like, look, buddy, it's not my fault. I didn't ask you to point this bird out to me. But he's like, do you see it? It's over there. I'm like, where? Over there? And he's like, yeah. Finally, I, I just lie, and it's like, oh, yeah, I see it. And he's like, no, you don't, you know, because he could tell my head was like, you know, if the bird was over there, my head was like tilted over there. No, you don't. 
So, and, and he was really getting to know me. He's like, look, buddy, I can't help. I don't have the best eyesight. I don't see what you're saying. You know, it's a brown bird inside brown trees. You know, I'm not going to be able to see it very easily. But anyhow, um, yeah, they're, they're, that, that, that sounds like a good idea for, for that. Um, have you identified goals that you have for your users or for you? Do you want to share maybe one, one or two of them? Okay. 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 Right. Right. And and then I'm featuring you know some of the birds that would be more you're more likely to see in that area. Okay. So, so the goal would be to you know some people are you know some of my traveling and looking for a place to okay. go. Okay. Okay. So the goals, if I can paraphrase, would be to help people maybe that are new to the area find places or that are traveling that, that might look for Ohio birds as opposed to wherever they're, they're normally from. Uh, to give people an idea of places to go, to give people uh, an idea of some of the common birds they like to see in a particular area. Um, are you concerned that your topic is too big or too narrow? Okay. But I feel like it's a website that could grow because I right. I had to make it manageable, but right. four states. Okay. And you, you could keep adding states. Yeah. Um, the the statement was is that uh, the the student picked four states to start with. So in other words, to talk about every bird, to talk about birding in every place in the world would obviously be a mammoth undertaking. Um, so what she did is she, she limited it to, even the United States would be a mammoth undertaking. So she limited it to four states, all right, which is good. Um, and I think that provides a good lesson for you is <clears throat> just about whatever your topic is, if you think about it, there's ways to expand it or narrow it down, all right? So for example, birding, if you're going to talk about finding every bird in the world, all right, would be a gigantic topic. You know, it's, it, 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 you know, you, you would you would bury yourself in the work for that one. So you narrow it down to a specific region, um, or uh, in this case, specific states, and that's a good way to narrow. That's a great way to narrow this topic down. And I did, two, and I'm thinking I'm only going to do two locations per state. Okay, and then only two locations per state. Yes. Yeah. Exactly, and then limit the the number of locations per state. And if you think about it, uh, again, you know, people sometimes have the notion that more is better, all right? And um, especially software developers, because they start thinking, and, and web developers, because they think, you know, you know, I want to give my users tons of information. I want to have so much resources and all that. Um, you have to be careful with that kind of mindset because sometimes if you throw all these options in front of people, they have no idea what to do, you know, and they're, they're not really sure, you know. Compare going to your uh, Mr. Softy wagon uh, that comes by with ice cream where your choices are chocolate and vanilla with going to like a Baskin Robbins 31 flavors, you know. Hey. You know what you want when you go to Mr. Softy, you want chocolate or vanilla. You go to 31 Flavors, you're standing there for an hour looking, hmm, do I want this or do I want that, all right? And therefore, if you, in this case, if you provided tons of sites, you know, well, unless you're very careful, people are going to like not know what the best of those sites are and maybe pick a site that's more obscure than other sites and might miss a really great opportunity because there's so much there that they end up picking uh, a, a place that's maybe slightly less good than some of the others. So if you really focus on, on uh, providing that, that's a valuable service. So uh, I guess the bottom line is it's not always about how much information, it's about providing good information and targeting that 
and really allowing your user to focus on the best stuff that's on your site. So I think that's, those are some very good strategies as far as that goes. Do you have any concern for um, the site, for, for, for your project? No. Uh, you know, last week I talked to you a little bit. We, I was struggling with, um, I'm trying to think of what I was struggling with because I'm tech <laughs> but I was struggling with the, you know, how I would do my navigation. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. And, I, and that could then now instead of being a six to eight page website, it's a sixteen page website. Right, right, right. But I, I'm right. Okay. Uh, again, uh, to to paraphrase, uh, some concern about the navigation and how to lay that out. And again, that is that is a very important thing to be concerned about and, and to think through, because uh, again, the best site in the world, um, or, or let, let me rephrase that, the site with the most information in the world is useless if it's hard for people or not intuitive for people to, to figure out how to go from page to page. Anyone else care to volunteer what, what you're thinking of working on? Let me ask this and you can be honest with me. We're all friends. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna yell or, or throw anything. Who has no idea what they're gonna do their project on? Okay, that's fair. See, I'm calm. All right. Um, I get this periodically. I, I, I get well, not periodically. Almost every semester, I get people that are, are not sure of what to, what to work their project on. All right. Um, my suggestion to them is to it would be to pick something that they like, pick something they know about, and pick something they like. And as long as it is appropriate for a, a college class, all right, and it's not wildly inappropriate material, you know, there's a way to make a project for it. Uh, almost any project can be expanded or contracted, all right, to, to be made bigger or to be made smaller. Question? Kind of a stupid question, but the only thing I'm a little wonder, wondering about my project is how much is copyright going to be an issue on our, I know because it's for educational, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, is that an issue? Is copyright an issue? Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, it absolutely is. We need. It could be for what I want to do. We need, we need to honor copyright law. Yeah. And what does that mean? Well, there's some guidelines uh, uh, as far as it goes. You know, that's kind of you know. Think of this almost like a term paper. Is copyright an issue on a term paper? Yeah, it's an issue. You can't simply take a block of text and put it on on your paper as though it's your own. And the same sort of guidelines would apply. Uh, do you care to specifically say what? Yeah, I want to do mine on a kind of like um, history of um, the French language and the different okay. places that they speak French and mix and match different texts. Okay. It's called different texts and put it together. And, you know, I, that, my only concern right now is how to uh, square that with. Well, again, if you notice on Angel, there is um, there is um, guidelines for copyright in an educational context. We can take a quick look at, at those. I mean, are, are you, is, would that be an issue with birding? I don't know. I, yeah, I'm worried about that myself. Yeah. I'm okay. Because I'm planning, you know, I think a lot of my site has to have the images that I okay. are specific, you know, specific things I'm going to be looking for. Yeah. And kind of get those. Well, let's, let's, let's take a look at the copyright guidelines. Um, one thing, again, is, is um, you know, there's always you could pursue the Creative Commons way and, and, and look for that. But even in the absence of that, we can look at the guidelines for copyright in an educational context. And I hope th these will provide you some insight or some guidelines to go over. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember you provided that. Well, let, let's, let's talk, a, let's, let's review it. Well, 
Right. All right, first of all, original material must be lawfully acquired. So you can't, <coughs> you know, you can't uh, download uh, a, a video clip and credit it to Pirate Bay or something like that, right? So you had to get it legally to begin with, all right? Guidelines are for educational purposes only. Okay, um, I would imagine that what's most relevant for our uh, projects would be B, text material, or D, illustrations, photos. Um, there are guidelines for other things that are relevant, like in my multimedia classes, but we'll look on text material. 10% or 1,000 words, all right? So if you have a resource and you're bringing something in, you can use up to 10% or 1,000 words, whatever is less. All right? Um, and illustrations, photos, no more than five by an artist. Now, that may be a little tricky in the case of that, but I think it would be acceptable to say that if you're pulling it from a website, consider each website an artist. So don't pull more than five from a particular website. And the biggest thing is to give credit. You know, as long as you are not wholesale duplicating pages and stealing tons of images without giving credit, you know, you're in good shape it is sort of the bottom line. Um, we know through CSS how we can style our credits any way we want to. For example, if you, if you want to put an image up with a credit saying where you've gotten it from and you don't want it to be obtrusive, um, you know, you can style it so that it's very inconspicuous at the bottom of the page or underneath the image or whatever. So, you know, you can do that. That's okay. You, know, you don't have to have a banner saying where you got it from, you know, as long as the attribution is there. So I guess the, the, the real key things are is limit what you take. And here are some guidelines as far as that goes. And give credit. Um, let's see. Other things. Ah, this is, this is good. Um, distort uh, the, the intent of the ori uh, originator. Um, that would involve, you know, if you were, I, I can't really think of a birding example. <laughs> you know, but if you were to take a picture of someone and Photoshop it to show them, I don't know, doing something stupid, that would not be, that would not be allowable within copyright law. So, because that would be distorting the intent of the picture, or, 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 or of the of the material. Um, if you're talking about web materials, it would always be good to have a link to the original. So, you know, for example, you talked about you know, showing text in, in English and French. You know, if, you, if, if you're talking about a web resource, you could have that, you know, pull a quote from it or, a, a, you know, within the guidelines, a, a amount of text, and then provide a link to the original source underneath it. Um, and, and that would be good. That way, that way, if your audience wanted to get more material, they have the link. It is legal to link to any site. So that is not a copyright concern at all, all right? So in other words, can I link to a, su a certain site? Yeah, you can. Um, so that's not really uh, a, a question. So you can always, for the case of images or whatever, you can always take a few or take a, a, a quote from something and then link to the original and you'll always be okay. Because you're giving, actually your link in that case gives attribution, right? And it, it allows your, your, your user to get more information about it if, if they want. But yeah, we definitely need to respect copyright law in this class. Uh, again, it is different given the fact that um, um, this is an educational um, experience. The options, again, uh, other options besides copyrighted material is stuff that's licensed under Creative Commons. I, I, I think I mentioned that when we looked at Flickr. You can actually find other stuff that's licensed by Creative Commons or stuff that's in the public domain. All right. Um, certain texts, for example, that were published years ago are in the public domain. So in your case of French, 
if you wanted to quote something from Les Miserables, you, you're free and clear to do that because that's old enough of a book that, it, that, that the copyright no longer applies. Um, one interesting point about copyright, by the way, that I think a lot of people don't realize is if you publish something on a website, it's copyrighted. So you don't have to say, gee, I wonder if this image is copyrighted, you know. If I go to if I go to Elsie's website. You might say, gee, is that image copyrighted? The answer is yes. All right. Even if there, well, there happens to be a copyright notice on this page, but even if there wasn't a copyright notice on that page, this image is copyrighted. All right. So don't, you know, don't go to a page and say, well, you know, I didn't see a copyright notice, so it wasn't copyrighted. No. Unless it says otherwise, you can assume that it's copyrighted. So unless it says explicitly that it's licensed with a Creative Commons license or it's in the public domain. Yes? Yeah, exactly. Like the, the question was is when you, when you build your own site, uh, a lot of times don't you end up buying photos? And, and the answer is yeah. So for example, this I believe is actually an LC student. All right, someone took uh, her photo here. But um, those are called stock photos, and uh, let me do a quick. I stock photos one I was looking for. You can, for example. Let's say I wanted, uh, I wanted a picture of a college student, but I didn't want to go out and actually find and take a picture of a college student. I could do a search for college student. I'm using an outdated browser. All right. And here we go. There's a student thinking about what she's going to do her project on. Group of students and so on. So notice these are very generic. In other words, you could put these on LC's site, right? And uh, you know, no one would no one would be the wiser. Notice what they do, by the way, is um, it might be a little hard to see. There's a watermark going across it, and there's a big X so that you can't just go and steal this image. Uh, off their website. But yeah, a lot of times what you will do is you will go and you'll, you'll buy these. And these particular ones, um, or many of them, are what are called royalty free. Which means, for example, that if I were going to publish a book, you know, if I were going to publish a book and use it a bunch of times, or use this image in, a, in, a, in an ad and on my website, you may, with some licensing, have to pay a royalty every time you use it. Whereas royalty free means you, you buy it, you can use it. By the way, the internet has kind of killed the stock photo uh, business for professional photographers. Because now, you know, good camera equipment is so inexpensive that really anyone can go. And back in the old days, photographers used to make a bundle of money selling stock photos. And now with the internet, you know, the old supply and demand, supply went through the roof, so the price has gone down quite a bit for this. So absolutely, that's one of the ways that you could obtain that, is you can get professional quality pictures for relatively cheap. And the idea is, you know, I would say, I would rather see a picture of an actual LC student. I can tell that's the campus. If you look closely, I think that's Starbucks over here. All right. I would rather see an actual picture of LC students. So yeah, it took a little bit longer and some effort. But if you don't want that extra expense or time or hassle, or you don't have a professional photographer, or you don't have the equipment, stock photos are a good option. 
All right. And again, Creative Commons is also a very common option, especially like for nonprofits. Many people are willing to let nonprofit organizations use their, their photography uh, without charging. Great question, though. I mean, it, it is something that we do want to respect. Yes? Now, my, my, one, my concern was just, uh, you don't see why, from what I've said, my idea wouldn't be doing that. Because the idea of the Internet is that you can copyright the work that you're doing. No, your, yours, yours seems, again, don't take too much text and give credit to the originator. And, and, and make sure you're quoting, yeah, make sure you're referring to a site that is acceptable as opposed to, again, Pirate Bay or whatever, some torrent site or whatever. All right. Um, now, I guess next time we'll talk about tables. All right. Uh, and again, remember, your project questions are critical. So do bring your project materials and your questions to class so that we can discuss them. Uh, even if I don't ask for it, please raise your hand and ask questions uh, about the project. All right, we'll see you over in lab. Anyone wants career service stuff is up here.